Yes, that's fine. Awesome, fantastic. Yeah, so again, maybe you can help uh, Yuri Petrovich to fix videos and then we go back yes. to your talks. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. Then let me introduce Carl Square. So Dr. Carl Square um, is a, a neurophysiologist who did excellent works and on multiple models and um, he uh, did um, very great um, studies on cat model and actually it's how we met, I guess, because uh, we had same experience with cat model to study basic mechanisms of um, CPG activation. And uh, Carl uh, joined our team at May Clinic a few years back and then he did exciting studies here on uh, red model uh, with chronic uh, regeneration studies and on peak model as well. And then he went back to Mexico for a faculty position and uh, he, right now he's uh, driving the study on clinical and with again neuromodulation for patients with uh, spinal cord injury and specifically for spasticity. So, Carlos, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. So please. Thank you, Igor, for this kind invitation. I really want to thank you because it's a very important opportunity to share with you our experience. Actually, because of the pandemic, I have to apologize in advance because of the pandemic in Mexico, we are experiencing some problems here. So we, um, we are not able to present results now because there are some restrictions, but I'll be happy to share with you our protocols, title evaluation of the effect of dry needling or transcutaneous electrical stimulation on spasticity. And this is a randomized clinical trial. Uh, my name is Carlos Cuellar. I am professor at the, and in, investigator at the School of Sports Science, Sciences at the Nahuac Mexico University. So Anahuac, the name of our university means in ancient Mexican language or ancient Aztec language on the valley. So you can see here this beautiful uh, landscape of Mexico City actually uh, on the valley surrounded by some volcanoes. Actually in those days where there is no air pollution, we can see very well those volcanoes and mountains around Mexico City. This is a view from our university. This is the central library. Well, of course, we have uh, very good collaborators. Uh, we have uh, in our team, Dr. Pablo Herrero. He's an expert on uh, one of the techniques uh, that I'm gonna talk about today, the dry needling technique. Uh, he's working at the University of Zaragoza in Spain. And he has been publishing about this technique, dry needling for, for many years, so he's an expert. And then we have Dr. Jimena Figueroa. He's physiotherapist this is working at uh, Anahuac University in Mexico. Also, also, Dr. Antonio Ibarra, he's an expert in spinal cord injury. And of course, you know, Dr. Igor Lavrov. Well, I'm gonna talk about the spasticity first. We know that this condition, this disorder is present in around 65% of multiple sclerosis patients and about the same percentage in spinal cord injury subjects. And also after uh, in post-stroke survivors, is, is spasticity is a condition present in 40 to 60%. And obviously there's some uh, controversies about definition about what is a spasticity. Actually Nielsen and collaborators published a very nice review one year ago. So they are talking about different mechanisms that, is, that they are causing spasticity. So if you take a look at this diagram, uh, on, the, on the left side, there is what the um, neurologist measures during clinical examination after a central motor lesion. And we have the altered mechanical property, properties, the contracture, and uh, we have also sustained involuntary muscle activation or the spastic dystonia and increased stretch reflexes or spasticity properly and increased cutaneous and nociceptive, nociceptive spinal reflex activity or spasms. So this is, this is leading to increased muscle tone or resistance. And what causes spastic movement disorder? Well, again, after a central motor lesion, there are altered mechanical properties in the, the contracture of the muscle, also paresis, muscle atrophy and weakness, also impaired coordination, of muscle activity, compensatory muscle contractions to maintain posture and stability, and also sustain involuntary muscle activation or the spastic dystonia. 
all these factors are leading to spastic movement disorder. And obviously, spasticity is associated with a reduction in functional independence in those subjects. As I mentioned before, there are a few definitions about the spasticity. So we have here one definition by Burridge and collaborators. So this definition, this definition says that this uh, spasticity is a disorder sensory motor control resulting from an upper motor neuron lesion and presenting as intermittent or sustained involuntary activation of muscles. And we have also a second definition by, by Pandian and collaborators. It's more a pathophysiological definition actually. So spasticity can be seen as a velocity dependent abnormal activation of muscles to an externally imposed stretch, as clonus, spasms, and continuous muscle activation, also uh, with uncoordinated movement patterns, as you can observe here in this uh, picture. And what are the options for managing spasticity? Well, the first, I will say, is physical therapy, also anti-spasticity drugs, but we know the undesired side effects of the spasticity drugs are dizziness and so on. Uh, there's also botulinum tox toxin, intrathecal drug pumps that actually are delivering anti-spasticity drugs, and finally, risotomy. You know very well this strategy, this approach, so I'm, I'm just going to talk about a few details because we're going we're gonna to use transspinal or transdermal or transcutaneous electrical stimulation to evaluate if, if it has an, uh, some effect on spasticity. As you know, transspinal cutaneous or electrical stimulation is delivered through a peripheral electrodes or a single electrode placed on the paravertebral, uh, on the, uh, vertebral column spanning mainly T11, T12, and L1 because it's the, the electrical stimulation is targeting those spinal circuits uh, involved in, 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 in movement of the uh, limbs, lower limbs. And uh, a couple of electrodes are placed also as the anodes on the belly or hypogastral region or over the iliac crest. And as you can observe here, there are beautiful recordings. Which actually, there are very interesting uh, talks before. And you know that when a stimuli is delivered, you can observe, you can record muscle twitches and the PRMs or posterior root reflexes, posterior root motor activation, and you can record responses in both um, bilaterally in, in, in both legs. For example, here we can observe responses in quadriceps, hamstrings, tibialis anteriors, and triceps rear. And as you can see, and, and as you know, the responses are very similar to uh, responses evoked by epidural stimulation. So we know that uh, transcutaneous stimulation is targeting is activating the same kind of the same mechanisms as a P-roll stimulation. And uh, talking about electrical stimulation for spasticity, I present here a table with some, a few uh, papers published in the last years uh, delivering uh, electrical stimulation and evaluating spasticity. I apologize in advance if maybe there is a one paper missing here, but you can see here in this paper published by Ursula Hofstetter some years ago, they enrolled three patients and the, pro the, the parameters for stimulation are the same. So they're using, they used 50 Hertz, the frequency of stimulation during 30 minutes, but it was just a cross-sectional uh, cross sectional study for one session. And after some years, actually one year ago, they published a, a very nice paper with 12 subjects and they use the same parameters of the stimulation. And in one subject, they evaluated the long-term effects for six weeks in one subject. And there is another uh, paper published by Mura and Niku in one subject, uh, but they use 0.2 Hertz of stimulation during 55 minutes for our 14 sessions. And it's very interesting because they uh, reported some of the outcome measures well, where that uh, subject self-reported reduced frequency and severity of spasms, but you can see differences in frequency of stimulation. So that's a, a very important difference. And also a paper published some years ago by Estes, they use again 50 Hertz for over 30 minutes, but just in one session. Some of the outcome measures were the Wattenberg pendulum test, EMG, to record co-contractions in, in antagonistic and agonistic muscles. 
the uh, 10, meters, 10 meters walk test, and uh, also some clinical evaluation for clonons, spasms. And in, it's very interesting because in this, in this last paper, uh, authors saw improvements even one week after withdrawal of transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation. So again, there are just a few papers uh, evaluating the spasticity during transcutaneous electrical stimulation. So what about a dry needling technique? So I'm going to reset the video. OK, here we go. Well, uh, actually, it could be intimidating, but actually dry needling is a very safe, uh, it's not discomforting technique, it has been widely used in managing you know, fascial pain, trigger points, and soft tissue injuries. Actually, in the video, you can see Dr. Pablo Herrero, one of our collaborators, uh, evaluating this post-stroke survivor. You can observe the spasticity in the, in the right hand. Well, uh, this concept of trigger points is very important for a protocol. So trigger points are discrete, hyper-irritable nodules, uh, knots, contraction knots in a taut band of the skeletal muscle. Which is, is, which is palpable and tender. You can feel it during a physical examination. So Dr. Pablo Herrera is doing that right, the, the examination and then the needling, as you can observe here in this muscle. And after a few uh, functioning, you'll see a decrease in spasticity. Actually, Dr. Herrera published and has been uh, working with this technique for over 15 years. So there, this technique is termed fast in, fast out, needling, and you'll see a reduction in, in spasticity. I'm going to skip it a little bit. So if you can observe now, there is a reduction in hypertonia and spasticity. And for this uh, post-stroke survivors, it's very important to have or to recover at least some, some, some movement, some grasping. So basically, I wanted to show you this technique to try kneeling. OK, we can now move on to the next slide. Well, but um, it's very important when you are doing dry kneeling to use ultrasound. This technique, imaging techniques, is very useful to localize the trigger points. Actually, in this image, you can observe in a knot in both muscle. So this is trapezius, and there is no um, um, and with some techniques, imaging techniques, you can see a color variance here indicates is uniform. So this indicates homogeneous stiffness. But what happened when we localize the trigger point as in this example? So with the, the ultrasound, the echography looks hypoechoic in this, uh, in this part pointed out by the arrow. And with this uh, imaging technique, you can see a focal decrease of color indicating a localized stiffer region. And also here, when we can see different or multiple focal lesions, so those are trigger points. And with this imaging technique, we can observe those focal lesions. And this is very important because now the technique, the technique is ultrasound guided or echo guided, so we can precisely localize those trigger points and try the dry needling te technique. So there is some evidence why dry needling is useful for spasticity especially after a stroke. So there are some papers like this example. This was uh, published by Lou and collaborators one year ago. So they observed that after uh, dry kneeling, there is a reduction in the frequency of the spontaneous action potentials uh, recorded in this patient. You can observe the difference here also in amplitude and in the plot here. So there is a reduction in the discharge rate of spikes per second after dry kneeling. So there are also some, some papers published in, in animal models, for example, by Liu uh, some years ago, the Liu and collaborators. So um, it has been described that dry needling disrupts the end play. And so is there, there is a deflation of acetylcholine. As I mentioned before, there's a decreased frequency of the spontaneous action potentials. And also these techniques improves uh, blood flow leading to improvements in, in motor function. Of course, uh, there is a lot of uh, work to do, but um, a meta-analysis came out last year published by Fernandez de las Peñas, published this year actually. 
So in this paper, they compare dry kneeling for upper extremities and lower extremities. And it's very interesting because they mentioned they, they, the result was that this, there is a positive effect of dry kneeling on spasticity, but just in lower extremities, extremities as you can observe here. There is a very interesting um, discussion in this paper why lower extremities have more benefits when dry kneeling is, is applied. But again, there are just a few papers, as you can observe here. Th those papers were published in, in clinical trials during in post-stroke survivors. But what about dry kneeling for spasticity after spinal cord injury? Well, there's, there's just one case report published one year ago by Cruz Montesinos and collaborators. Uh, they presented a male, 45 years, 47 years old, with a cervical level surgery following a traumatic disc hernia. And he had also compromised functionality of the right upper and lower limbs, and of course, neuropathic pain, spasticity, and difficulties performing independent gait. Well, they found that uh, dry needling or the end improved measures of muscle spasticity, also dynamic gait stability, pain. This is a very important for, for a patient, a reduction in pain and daily independence. Of course, this is just was just a case report, but uh, they also reported immediate and short-term effects over 10 weeks. So this is it was very interesting. So in our protocol, we have basically three aims. The first is to evaluate dry needling or transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation and spasticity in the spinal cord injury subjects. And we also want to compare the effects of both techniques before, during, and after treatments and compare, of course, results with a control group. Some of, some of our inclusion criteria, adults more than 18 years old, male and females, and according to Asia classification, uh, it could be A, B, C, or D, but having a lesion and spinal cord injury below C7 and one year, more than one year after the spinal cord injury. Some of the exclusion criteria are not to present, not to have orthostatic hypertension, some fractures not resolved, uh, current infections of any, any, any kind, any type, Vesical catheter, spinal cord progressive degeneration, and also have participated in other clinical trials or protocols. So basically, this is the workflow. Uh, right now, we are in the enrollment phase. We have three groups. For each group, we will we'll have 10 subjects. This is the dry kneeling plus physical therapy group. Then the transspinal or transdermal electrical stimulation group plus physical therapy and a control group. group will get just physical therapy. So after basal evaluation, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna get the treatment for over eight weeks and a following for uh, eight weeks too. And we're gonna evaluate the spasticity every two weeks. I'm gonna talk about spasticity evaluation in a few slides uh, later. But I wanna talk first about the dry meal link group, about this technique. So patients are gonna get two or three sessions per week, depending on the symptomatology or the symptoms of, of the patient. And needling is gonna, needling is, is gonna be, um, it's gonna be applied in lower limbs and pelvic muscles, again, depending on the severity of symptoms in, in those subjects. Uh, for this purpose, we're gonna use disposable sterile stainless steel needles using the fast in and fast out technique that you saw previously in the video with Dr. Pablo Herrero. So each muscle will be needled for one minute. This is a general uh, guideline for this technique. And for transspinal electrical stimulation, well, we're gonna do first some uh, basic evaluation to, to make sure that the electrode placement will be, will be okay. So we'll verify it uh, before treatment sessions. So for this purpose, we're gonna apply the square pulses one millisecond width at 0.1 Hertz. And we're gonna record several muscles bilaterally, for example, rectal femoris, biceps femoris, TLS anterior, and triceps ray. Uh, for treatment, we're gonna apply, again, square pulses, same, uh, same duration, but the frequency of stimulation will be 50 Hertz during 30 minutes using a current control stimulator, and uh, patients or subjects will get three, se three sessions per week. Some of the spasticity tools for, to evaluate spasticity, well, we have clinical tools and electrophysiology tools. Uh, we're gonna 
evaluates plasticity by the modified Ashworth scale that you may know, I'm sure you know, the Wattenberg pendulum test, pen scale, and visual analog scale to account for uh, frequency and intensity of clonus and spasms. For electrophysiology, we're going to record the H reflex, but we're also interested in a very in, in a phenomenon term, rate dependent dependent depression of the H reflex. So we're going to apply different frequencies to see if there is uh, or to evaluate the spinal disinhibition. So we think that this could be a biomarker or electrophysiological marker for um, disinhibition in the spinal cord. And also we're gonna record EMG. So for passive movements, clonus and spasms. And we have been thinking in another outcome measures, for example, to measure autonomic function. So for this purpose, we're gonna evaluate autonomic function using the Asia Autonomic Standards Assessment Form. Also the quality of life and independence uh, through the spinal cord independence measure version three and also the quality of light index. So where we know, as I mentioned before, unfortunately, unfortunately we are not still uh, doing our experiments because of the pandemic and restrictions in Mexico. So right now we are in the enrollment uh, phase in collaboration with a foundation, a Camina Foundation. So Camina means in Spanish walk. Uh, they have provided us with a database with hundreds of patients with spinal cord injury in Mexico. So hopefully uh, we'll start a protocol soon and I would like to maybe share our results soon. So thank you very much. If you have any question or comment, I'm sure it will be very helpful. Thank you. So finally, <laughs> thank you. And this is my email if you want to stay in touch. Thank you, Igor. Carlos, thank you so much. It's a fantastic presentation and uh, very interesting study. Thank you for sharing uh, your protocol and your thoughts. So called explicit. It's a good time for questions. Uh, hello. Hello. I have, I have a question. Um, so, one, you can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, when you demonstrated the schematic regarding the spinal cord stimulation, you indicated the placement of the electrodes, and it's quite pretty obvious that the current will flow from the back to the to the to the belly actually. So it, it's going through the through the through the organs of uh, of the body. And uh, what effects of this stimulation to the other organs rather than spinal cord could you indicate in here? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, as far as I know. Could be some some effects in some muscles, basically uh, muscles of abdominal muscles, and uh, actually transcutaneous electrical stimulation has been applied also to to provide some benefits in cardiovascular function. So I'm sure that electrical current can, in some extent, at some extent, uh, target some muscles. But as far as I know, there are no side effects or on or some problems affecting some, some organs. So we know that if we apply the current stimulation around T11, T12, L1, we're gonna target mainly spinal circuits involved in, in movements of the, uh, of the limbs. Maxim Olegovich, it's a great question actually. Um, it will be also great to ask Yuri Petrovich his vision on this. Uh, there are multiple studies right now where people are focusing on stimulation of specific peripheral or organs or related nerves. And the whole SPARC program was designed just for that. And definitely it's still a question to what extent uh, we can influence some other systems by doing transdermal stimulation. Yeah, maybe it's not only important movement, but also bladder function, for example. And, and so on, right? So right now there are some protocols studying bladder function, how transdermal electrical stimulation is improving uh, sphincter control, for instance. Yeah. Carlos Mesca, so it was very interesting to hear your thoughts on using dry needle technique and trigger points. So uh, there are many other peripheral uh, targets, right? Uh, or techniques on peripheral side. So like, for example, uh, 
Botox, right? People use it for spasticity a lot. So I will say if you go to a clinic, rehab clinic in US, you usually see Botox first um, kind of type of therapy. So uh, let me ask you, uh, if you had some thoughts like between uh, Botox injunction, dry needle, or maybe some consecutive approach with this, like what, 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 what was your uh, like logic behind uh, choosing dry needle? Well, actually, it is very interesting because some people think that uh, that dry needling is similar to acupuncture and is not the same technique. So for many years, specifically in Spain, many groups have been working with this technique, uh, but in, in spastic patients, but after a stroke. So there are very good results in, in those spastic uh, patients. So we, we, we thought that this is a very different mechanism compared to electrical stimulation. So maybe later we can combine both and, and maybe there's a potentiation of both techniques. And we know that reduction in spasticity is important for uh, rehab, right? Rehabilitation. So after dry kneeling, uh, patients can't move their hands, uh, also the, the arm and, and so on. So we think this could be an, an important first step toward combination of both techniques. And also, as, you, as I mentioned, there's just a few, a few papers addressing uh, the mechanisms of, of dry needling. So I think that because we are going to use electrophysiological techniques and some clinical approaches, maybe we're going to evaluate concisely and more precisely the effects of dry needling. So far, there are just a few, a few papers doing electrophysiology. So I think it's very important to have evidence, electrophysiological evidence on the benefits of dry kneeling and spastic subjects. Thank you, thank you so much. And actually I want to uh, check if uh, Elvira Rishatna uh, has any questions about this because he, she has great expertise in uh, working with trigger points and okay. some of her early work was, was done for um, uh, trigger points after stroke and uh, neck pain, I think. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure if she's available, maybe you can ask her. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> oh, you're, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not sure I can see you. Yeah, so uh, the question, um, since Carl's mentioned about trigger points, right? So um, I remember that you did uh, a great uh, work on um, uh, targeting those points for patients with uh, headache, right? I think after stroke as well. Uh, but I think it was primarily neck, uh, neck pain and headache, right? So I wonder if you see any uh, uh, like correlation between your study and what Carlos presented and uh, how you estimate potential to use uh, dry needle technique versus other techniques uh, for trigger points in rehab process. Uh, okay, um, so uh, my work was uh, about uh, how trigger points of neck muscles can affect our uh, postural control, uh, and uh, I revealed that um, a great number of um, trigger points in neck muscles uh, above uh, four. Uh, for affected muscles uh, can um, affect our postural control and decrease it. Um, what about dry needling? Actually, <laughs> um, uh, for trigger point cure, uh, we uh, not uh, use it, I mean, uh, spreadly. Uh, because uh, it is considered a bit um, invasive method uh, for trigger point treatment. Um, but um, in case of spasticity, um, I think it could be used. Uh, and as Carlos showed, uh, it is pretty, uh, I mean, it works. <laughs> Uh, for spasticity, it works for it's good to know. <laughs> yes, it works for trigger points at, as well. But um, 
I don't know, my professor <laughs> when I uh, when I study in medical university always said that it is too hard, I mean, too invasive method for trigger point uh, treatment. So uh, uh, we not really use it, but it is work. Thank you. Thank you. It's yeah, definitely will be a great discussion maybe sometime later maybe between you, Carlos, and uh, Carlos, I also want to ask like maybe last question. Um, so you saw presentation of Dr. Artur Bektimirov today. He uh, discussed his experience with epidural stimulation for spasticity. From your standpoint, how do you see potential combination of non-invasive and invasive stimulation for spasticity? Yeah, I think could be a great a great step or a great combination so as also you mentioned before maybe it is, will be important to select so those responder patients with transcutaneous stimulation and then try epidural stimulation right so as you can see as you as you as i, as I mentioned in, in previous slides so there are just a few papers addressing uh, spasticity during transcutaneous electrical stimulation so we have a lot of work to do, but also I think it's, it's very important. And um, also you, you presented some very interesting results with uh, that transcutaneous electrical stimulation improves, for example, posture and coordination. So I think uh, it is something that we have to try later. So the, the first step obviously could be transcutaneous stimulation and then move to epidural stimulation for spasticity evaluation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Igor. So, colleagues, if, uh, if there is no more questions, uh, we can continue and uh, we can uh, move back to Yuri Petrovich's presentation. Yuri Petrovich, uh, how, how it works in the end? All, all's good? Yuri Petrovich, I uh, don't hear you Хорошо все виду, но не слышно вас. Are you hear me, Игорь? Да, да, сейчас хорошо, сейчас замечательно. И видно, слышно. Да, 